Hi, this is Elizabeth, one of the co-hosts of Beauties and Headcanons. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. How's it going, everybody? Hey, guys. This is Keith. And Katie. From Coffee with Keith and Katie on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. When you're done listening to this show, I hope you'll come check out our show, Coffee with Keith and Katie. A new episode comes out every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. The latest headlines. The Houston Astros, the defending World Series champions, got better, adding Garrett Cole. The insightful interviews. Rick Saratella, NFL Draft Bible. With how much emphasis is put on the position, yet how many over the last couple of years we've had questions, why do we put such an emphasis on drafting a quarterback number one overall? The bottom line is there's not enough good quarterbacks to go around. And I think with the new CBA, it's really a low-risk gamble now. If you look at the playoff teams, the common denominator, good quarterback play. The hottest takes. I think the guy to blame is the one guy who hasn't left yet. I think Russell Westbrook is one of the bigger problems in Oklahoma City. Can all be found on Press Row. Broadcasting is part of the Public House Media Network. Here's your host. It doesn't matter what your name is. Christian Heimel. Welcome into Press Row, ladies and gentlemen, on this Thursday, May 30th, 2019, a historic day it is as the NBA Finals get set for tonight, the Toronto Raptors and the Golden State Warriors, and I know everybody's been talking about it, I know it's been one of the biggest topics in sports uh, media over the last few days, but we are going to talk about it here on the show. Louise Zatzman of Raptors Republic is going to join us in just a little bit, because listen, The old news is that the Golden State Warriors are yet again in the NBA Finals. Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, as injured as he may be, Klay Thompson, Andre Iguodala, Steve Kerr, the Golden State Warriors. You know this script. What you may not know are the Toronto Raptors, a team in their 24th season, making it to their first ever NBA Finals, a team that many people saw as a potential favorite heading to the NBA Finals, but maybe not one of the favorites. So we're going to talk about all of that uh, in just a little bit with Luis Zotsman again of Raptors Republic. But I want to take a minute, and this is kind of the stuff that I've been talking about. This is some of the things that were really kind of important to look at. And I've said it multiple times. No matter even if you think the script is already written, Golden State's about to win their fourth title in fifth year in five years, this is a phenomenal thing for the NBA. This is so good for basketball, so good for the sport, so good for the national media in the US and in Canada. This is a great thing here uh, for for so many teams, and it's so exciting. I cannot wait. I'm really pumped about it, uh, and, and you know, as, as I as I write this and as we speak here, I'm trying to find the preseason favorites for the NBA championship, um, just to see where the uh, Toronto Raptors fell uh, prior to this season. And if you look at it, Golden State again was favored. The Toronto Raptors, uh, let's see here, Toronto was a forty to one odd. These were the 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 preseason uh, odds here, according to Las Vegas, uh, the Westgate Vegas Superbook. Golden State runaway favorites. Houston and Philadelphia tied at seven to two. Boston eight to one. San Antonio, who by the way was integral in Toronto's run, we'll get into that in a minute. The Lake, uh, excuse me, the Clippers at twenty, or the, the Lakers at twenty to one. Uh, Miami at twenty to one, Cleveland at thirty to one, Toronto at forty to one, Utah, Portland, Oklahoma City, New Orleans, Minnesota. There's so many. It's incredible. Toronto a forty to one odd, and this was all the way back on June 11th of last year. The fact that the Lakers were twelve to one odds was incredible. Toronto wasn't even on the front page of all of these things. It's incredible to think 
that all of these things happened uh, to be able to make this a, a possibility. And again, I mentioned the San Antonio Spurs. They were a huge part about it. This was an incredible high-risk, high-reward trade that Masai Ujiri, the Toronto GM, made to make this happen. Kawhi Leonard and Denny Green heading to uh, Toronto for DeMar DeRozan. When you look at it, last year in the semifinals against Boston, or excuse me, against Cleveland, when they were swept eventually by Cleveland, Yajiri wasn't happy. LeBron just dominated, made it ridiculous. It, it wasn't even close. And this was a, a San Antonio team that was looking for a way to get rid of Kawhi Leonard, a disgruntled star, which is very rare to happen in San Antonio. You look at that, and the Spurs generally keep their players pretty much under lock and key. They they do a very good job of protecting the brand, so to speak, uh, in San Antonio. But not only do they do they willingly deal one of the greatest defensive players in this current game, one of the rising offensive stars in this game as well. And then you you also send Denny Green, one of the better three-point shooters, and all you get back, and I know it wasn't just DeMar DeRozan, but when you get back a, a player like that who is a fan favorite and you're willing to give that away, let me tell you folks, from personal experience, when you're willing to get rid of one of the most beloved players by your fans in order for the betterment of your organization, you're doing your job correctly as a general manager. Hats off to Masai Ujiri for what he's done in Toronto to put this together because not only do you have a tremendous talent in Kawhi Leonard, who in the playoffs is shooting better than 50% from the floor, better than 38% from three-point range, averaging, I think it's something like, uh, I, I don't know, like 23 points per game, something like that. 31, excuse me, 31 points per game, averaging nine rebounds a contest, four assists, two steals. He's being Kawhi Leonard, but he's also elevating himself to a, dare I say it, LeBron James-esque style of play in the postseason. He's doing everything for this team. And you just watch how he's played. The three to win Game 7 and let them move on against Philadelphia. The way he played against Milwaukee. You pair him with Kyle Lowry, Pascal Siakim, Marc Gasol, Denny Green. Fred Van Vliet has figured it out over the last couple of games shooting-wise. Uh, Serge Ibaka, who I think may have been the most underrated player and underappreciated player on those Oklahoma City teams back when it was Harden and Westbrook and Durant, uh, was was in, incredible and has been very good. This is a team that defensively stacks up very, very well with Golden State, and you have to give all credit. Look, I know a lot of it's going to go uh, to Nick Nurse in his very first year as a head coach and Kawhi Leonard and Denny Green and Kyle Lowry and the players, and it should, but Yajiri... As a GM, Masai Yajiri did something that is very difficult to do in getting rid of a fan favorite. It's not the first time he did it. Remember, when he was in Denver as the VP of Basketball Operations, he was the one that got Carmelo Anthony to the New York Knicks and, and getting a bunch of promising young folks and, and, and made that deal and did it pretty easily. But for him to do this in Toronto with such a young team, to get a young core together... In, in a year where the East was up for grabs because LeBron was no longer a part of it, Masai Yajiri, make no doubt about it, is the reason the Toronto Raptors are in the NBA Finals. We'll talk with Louis Zatzman about not only Yajiri's role in this, but obviously Kawhi Leonard and everybody's talking about what it means for Nick Nurse, what it's like in general in Toronto right now, and what the scene will be like tonight at Jurassic Park when the Raptors host the Golden State Warriors in Game 1 of the NBA Finals. Your listener questions as well coming up at the end of the show. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, review in, uh, on Springer.com, Stitcher.com, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, and of course, PublicHouseMedia.org. we got a lot more great show coming up for you guys. Really excited for you all to stick around. Uh, don't wait up. It's going to be a fun show. You're on Press Row, broadcasting as part of the Public House Media Network. Want to be part of the show? Go to Facebook and search Press Row Podcast dash Public House Media. Or find us on Twitter and Instagram at Press Row PHM. You can also email the program Press Row PHM at gmail.com. 
This is Bryce Burge, host of Your Soccer Passport here on Public House Media. After this episode, come join us on a trip around the soccer world as we discuss club and country every Tuesday. Stamp your soccer passport by subscribing on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your Public House Media podcasts. And thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. This is Press Row with Christian Heimel, a Public House Media podcast. Welcome back on Press Row here, ladies and gentlemen, on this Thursday, May 30th, 2019. A historic uh, Thursday, a historic May 30th as well, considering that tonight, for the first time in history, the Toronto Raptors will be playing in the NBA Finals. It's been one of the ones that, when you started the season, they may have been in that top three or four that you thought of to come out of the East, but not sure how many people outside of Toronto thought they would be that team coming out of the East. And then when the playoffs began, of course, with Philadelphia and Milwaukee and uh, maybe the Celtics there, they were able to come through. And for the first time in franchise history, the Toronto Raptors playing the, for the NBA finals and to help us talk a little bit more about how this team got to where they are and their chances coming up against uh, the Golden State Warriors is Louis Zatzman, reporter with Raptors Republic. Uh, Louis, thank you so much for the time. Take us through kind of the emotion in the city of Toronto since their Game 6 win over Milwaukee. Yeah, Toronto's been going absolutely crazy. I mean, at Game 6, you show up uh, maybe two and a half hours, three hours early as media. And by the time you, I got there, there was already a line to go to Jurassic Park, for those of you not from Toronto, it's uh, sort of where you can watch for free outside in a big crowd. A line maybe a kilometer long of people in the thunder and lightning, in the pouring rain. I mean, Toronto is going insane. Anywhere I go right now, outside on the subway, everyone's wearing Raptors paraphernalia, talking about them. The city is just really embracing this playoff run. It's impressive to see what they've done considering you know who they've gone up against and what this team looked like just a year ago. Uh, how, how much has... Kawhi Leonard and his presence really helped, and of course the new head coach and everything that changed. It's just amazing to see what these new voices and these new players have done for this team. What have they meant this year? Yeah, I'm glad in your intro you brought up expectations at the beginning of the season mm-hmm. because it's worth you know comparing now to then. Uh, because when Toronto traded for Kawhi Leonard, a lot of media in the city was saying Toronto could go to the finals. And actually, we spent much of the year being um, not disappointed with the team, but sort of waiting to see them turn it on. And, uh, of course, uh, Valanciunas was injured fairly early. Toronto lost him for a while and ended up trading him for Mark Saul, who uh, had a good regular season, but not a great one. Mm -hmm. And so still going into the playoffs, I mean, we didn't know what this team could be. Um, and then, of course, the playoffs began, and uh, long-winded intro, but you asked what to- <laughs> Kawhi Leonard has been to Toronto, we found out in the playoffs. I mean, he has been maybe the best player in the world, just breaking records over and over, you know, um, most consecutive 30-point games, first player in NBA history to hit a Game 7 buzzer beater. Um, he's been unbelievable out there. He's just been something Toronto has never cheered for on the basketball court before. Uh, of course, those around him, you know, Marcus Saul has turned into just this defensive wizard. And uh, and even though we may not have seen their peak, they're still in the finals. You know, it's amazing to look at Kawhi and, and you look at some of these things and, and you wondered his career in San Antonio and what he did, obviously winning the championship in 13-14. Always that defensive stopper started to evolve a little bit as an offensive player uh, over the last couple of seasons. But there were a lot of questions as to what he would be able to do on the court in Toronto. And you've seen it this year, career high in minutes played, career high in points per game, career high in rebounds per game, top three season all time in terms of field goal percentage. Uh, His his three-point percentage has been up uh, over the last year as well, but how much of this has been him kind of in a city that has 
embraced him, but also kind of just let him be a, a bit of a celebrity and not try to, it's not a massive market that many of us in the United States would think of where he's constantly being hounded as a celebrity. He kind of lets him just be Kawhi Leonard. Yeah, it's definitely partly that. I think it's a collection of factors. Of course, San Antonio, um, famously, the collective is defined above the individual. Um, and so it's tough to be an all-NBA candidate in San Antonio. I mean, Tim Duncan, one of the greatest players of all time. But if you look at his numbers, they were a little bit understated. I mean, great numbers, don't get me wrong. But guys like Kevin Garnett always put up bigger numbers, even if Tim Duncan probably had a much bigger impact on winning. So Kawhi Leonard definitely had a little bit more uh, more ceiling to reach when he came to Toronto. But beyond that, his surrounding cast is great for him. I mean, Kyle Lowry, one of the best point guards in the league, and he does it by not taking a ton of shots. He does it by creating for others, um, by being just the definition of the film, the gaps player with his screen setting, his rebounding, his play calling, his passing, things that help other people score. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, Leonard himself improved. He's a much better pull-up shooter. Mm -hmm. He's stronger than he ever has been. I mean, his ability to just play through contact, it doesn't even affect him anymore. Um, so I think a, a number of factors have contributed to him really exploding. Um, and just Toronto being that, that blank canvas, certainly one of them. It's interesting to see, too, as we're speaking with Louis Zatzman here of Raptors Republic on Press Row. Uh, a lot of the, I don't want to say criticism, but I mean, obviously Toronto, it was great for, for Masai Ujiri to get uh, Kawhi Leonard. A lot of people, maybe the naysayers at least, wondering at what cost did it come. But to see the way this team has come together, you mentioned the Marc Gasol trade. But, I mean, Denny Green and and, and uh, Kyle Lowry, even Serge Ibaka to a point, but Fred Van Vliet over the last uh, couple of weeks and what he's been able to do, they've put together, as you said, a very strong supporting cast around this young, brilliant superstar in Kawhi Leonard. Yeah. Yeah, credit to Masai Ujiri. And um, part of the team's, you know, talent is its ability to shapeshift. Because we thought Toronto was going to be this offensive powerhouse. You mentioned uh, Van Fleet as a shooter. You know, Danny Green as a shooter. Kyle Lowry as a shooter. Um, and then they're just they're actually just a defensive grinding team that sometimes can struggle on offense. Um, they were that against Milwaukee, against Philadelphia. And I expect against Golden State, who probably it's tough to stop them in the half court, Toronto might shape shift again. We might see another version of them. And that is just because your jury has put together versatile two-way players who can really be whatever the court requires them to be. It's interesting because uh, on one of your latest posts on RaptorsRepublic.com, you mention and you kind of break down the NBA Finals comparison. And when you look at kind of the basic numbers that you have here side by side, it's incredible to see. Obviously, Golden State's offense is very, very good. But you mentioned the defense. And the way the Toronto Raptors have played defensively here uh, over the course of the playoffs has been as maybe one of their saving graces. Obviously, Kawhi's tremendous games have been helpful there, too. But how much do you think that this team defensively can really compete against Golden State? I think they can. Um, and uh, that's a controversial opinion because maybe no one can compete <laughs> with Golden State's offense. But... Uh, I mean, I could talk about Toronto's defense for 45 minutes. I won't, but uh, they just, their ability, one through five, to do whatever needs to be done. So some players are terrific on-ball defenders, and you want to switch. Um, you know, Pascal Siakam is one of those guys, just terrific on-ball guy. You want to switch him onto any action on the floor. But Toronto also has guys who are great off the ball digging into gaps, cutting down on passing lanes, uh, rotating behind blitzes, for example. Mm -hmm. um, Kyle Lowry is probably at his best as a, a freelancer, as is Marc Gasol. Um, so whether you need to switch, whether you need to blitz pick and rolls, whether you want to drop against non-shooter, as Toronto did against uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo, Ben Simmons, and Eric Bledsoe pick and rolls. I mean, whatever the defense calls for, they have the best personnel for it. And it's not just the starters. I mean, Fred Van Fleet's a better defender than he's an offender. Uh, Norman Powell, maybe. Serge Ibaka's definitely a better defender. Just their entire rotation 
is this shape-shifting defensive menace that can do whatever uh, is an offender's weakness. And so if you go to Golden State, they have the two best shooters of all time. But in their best lineup, the, the death lineup, Draymond Green's not an elite shooter. Um, Andre Iguodala's not a great shooter. And Toronto has just strangled offenses in Philadelphia and in Milwaukee by making those, uh, those poor shooters make decisions in space um, and taking away the passing lanes, taking away the lobs. So if Draymond Green beats Toronto from deep, I mean, so be it. But Toronto will make him do that. They won't give anything easy. At a 30,000-foot level here, because one of the things that has been pointed out by a lot of different people, it's been nine years since a non-LeBron James team came out of the East. Um, the last time was you know Ray Allen, Kevin Garnett, and, and Paul mm-hmm. Pierce with the Celtics in 2010 against the Lakers. How much do you think – And I, I'd like you to not keep to put your bias away from this in, in covering the team that you do, but – how much is this good for basketball that a team like Toronto with the stars like Leonard and Lowry are coming out of this East that was a really competitive and fun Eastern Conference playoffs to watch? Hey, I can never put my bias away. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it's definitely good for Toronto. Uh, rumors out of the city, uh, not confirmed yet, but Nick Nurse is uh, uh, rumored to be the next head coach of Team Canada. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you're already seeing the effect that this playoff run has had on, on basketball in the city, you know, Toronto right now already has a horde of the best, um, NBA media personalities in the world descending Mm -hmm. on the city, Jackie McMullen's here, Stephen A. Smith. Uh, it's just this, this who's who of brilliant people who uh, are going to be in Toronto for a a lot of time, hopefully over the next, uh, next couple of weeks. And, it's tough for me to say what it means for the larger market, but for Toronto, it certainly can't be overstated how important this is. What's this feeling going to be like? What's the scene going to be like there uh, in Toronto Thursday night? I think pandemonium. Uh, Kawhi Leonard shot that the game seven shot against Philly was probably outdone in terms of pandemonium uh, in game six and closing out against Milwaukee. And I'm, I'm expecting that to be outdone again in the final. He's Louis Zatzman of Raptors Republic. Find him on Twitter at Louis Zatzman. Uh, best of luck. Thanks so much for the time. It's been really fun to watch this Raptors team, and, and, and we're excited for them. And not that I don't dislike Golden State, but for the sake of the NBA, I am rooting for this Raptors squad to, to, to bring a title home. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a pleasure. All right, that's Louis Zatzman. Uh, game one tonight in Toronto as the Golden State Warriors and the Raptors get things going in the NBA Finals. When we come back, we'll get your listener questions, wrap up shop. You're on Press Row, broadcasting as part of the Public House Media Network. Listen to every episode and get the latest shows sent right to you. Subscribe to Press Row on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spreaker.com, and Stitcher.com. Or visit us online at www.thephmedia.com. This is Jenna Burt, host of the Confessions of a Military Spouse podcast here on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my show, Confessions of a Military Spouse, where we dig deep and talk about the unspoken hard truths of what it's really like to be a military spouse. A new show comes out bi-weekly. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of Confessions of a Military Spouse. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. This is Press Row with Christian Heimel, a Public House Media podcast. Welcome back on Press Rose. We close up shop here. Big thanks to Louis Zatzman of Raptors Republic for joining us on the show. And I, I am. I'm rooting for Toronto in this one. I mean, and it's not because I have anything against Golden State. I think what we are watching is one of the greatest teams that has ever been assembled, one of the greatest dynasties in sports history in the Golden State Warriors. But I think one of the biggest problems with the NBA is that there aren't enough teams that are built to go up against Golden State. And I think you have one team that 
and for the last five years, it hasn't been a team. It's been LeBron James. It's been can LeBron beat the Lakers or beat the Warriors. And now that you finally have a team that maybe can go up against them with Ibaka and Siakam and uh, Lowry and Gasol and Leonard, maybe you can. And, And whether DeMarcus Cousins and Kevin Durant actually play, who cares? You play with the cards that you're dealt. You dance with the girl you brought. And... I think that the best thing for the NBA is for the Toronto Raptors to at least take this to six games. Whether they win or not, it doesn't matter. But the fact that another team, somebody else, is actually competing for a title is a great thing for the NBA. Great thing for our show, you the fans. Don't forget you can listen, subscribe, rate, review, share us with your friends and family. We're on Stitcher and Spreaker.com. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or even on iHeartRadio. You can always find us on Public House Media. Dot org as well. You get to be a part of the show by finding us on Twitter and Instagram at PressRowPHM. Email the show, PressRowPHM at gmail.com, or you can find us on Facebook, Press Row Podcast by Public House Media, and ask your listener questions. First one, Mike from Rhode Island. The Boston Red Sox seem to be struggling, especially with the Rays and the Yankees. Who do you see them adding to be able to make a run? Honestly, there's one name. And it's a name that they should have had all along. Craig Kimbrell. Matt Barnes, as good as he has been and as talented as he may be, is not a major league closer. Craig Kimbrell, as old as he may be, as expensive as he may be, is a major league closer. Not only that, he's a World Series winning closer. The fact that the Boston Red Sox and nobody in general has jumped out to get Craig Kimbrell is absolutely insane. It's been nearly seven and a half months since he threw a pitch. This is incredible. This guy is so talented. Don't get me wrong. Growing up as a Boston Red Sox fan, he drives me freaking crazy. I can't stand it. But you cannot argue with facts. And the facts are he's got one of the dirtiest sliders in the game. He throws absolute cheese. And... He is one of the best closers of the last decade in Major League Baseball, if not longer, uh, going beyond the time that he's actually been in Major League Baseball. So if the Red Sox want to catch the Yankees, want to catch the Rays, I really do think they need to bring back Craig Kimbrell because that bullpen is really struggling. Don't get me wrong, the starting staff is, is struggling as well, but David Price, Chris Sale, Rick Porcello, Eduardo Rodriguez, they will figure it out. Matt Barnes cannot be your everyday closer if you plan on defending not only your American League East title, your American League title, your World Series title as well. So the Red Sox need to find a way to get Craig Kimbrell back in Boston. Joseph in Massachusetts asking uh, the Bruins and the Blues as well as the NBA Finals both have teams where it's rest versus rust. What is your take on it? Truthfully, the rest versus rust argument makes no sense to me whatsoever. If you're a professional athlete, you should be able to figure it out. I love the fact that the Bruins were scrimmaging each other during the Western Conference Finals when the Blues were still going at it and still trying to get their way there. Um, But if you're a professional athlete, this shouldn't be difficult. This should be something that you're able to go and do, that you're able to just realistically roll out of bed and go do. And rest is probably a good thing, especially when you get into the NBA Finals, or excuse me, the NHL Finals, especially when you are a team like the Boston Bruins who plays as physical as you do. You saw it in the first couple of games. They were a much more physical team. They were able to to play pretty well. I I agree that you can have some momentum and it can work in your favor. I mean, you look at, just to go back to the Boston Red Sox, their 2007 World Series championship when they absolutely ran ruck shot against the Colorado Rockies. That team was waiting around for a while while the Red Sox went to Game 7 against the Cleveland Indians. So there are arguments on both sides, but in my personal opinion, it makes no sense. If you're the best team, you're going to win no matter what. The best team always ends up winning in some way, shape, or form. They're able to take advantage of whatever opportunities are presented to them. So I don't believe in rest versus rust at all. Uh, I just believe that the best team finds a way to win no matter what. Last question here, Kyle in Pennsylvania. Uriah Faber making his return to mixed martial arts and to the UFC on July 13th. Your thoughts on him coming back? (sighs) I don't like it. I really don't. He hasn't fought since 2016. Uh, 34, he's a legend. Don't get me wrong. He really is. Um, But the the California kid, I, I think... 
just needs to, to, to move away. Inducted into the Hall of Fame two years ago. It's been three years since he actually fought, or two and a half. Um, 40 years old. This is going to be difficult. Going up against Ricky Simon in a Bantamweight match. Simon, at 26 years old, a young kid looking to prove something, 15-1. and one. I'm afraid this is going to go the way of Anderson Silva. Silva has struggled so much in his last couple of fights because of his age, because he's going up against younger guys who are hungry, who aren't scared of him anymore, and it's ruining the legacy. And I don't want to do that to Uriah Faber as well. So personally, I'm not a fan of it. I really wish that the California kid and Uriah Faber would just kind of stay home. Let us remember him for who he was. Because the thing that I hate, and this is the thing, nobody talks about it, and, and I'm actually happy about it, but nobody talks about it. Jerry Rice once played for the Seattle Seahawks, played for the Oakland Raiders. Joe Namath played for the Kansas City Chiefs. Brett Favre played for the Vikings, the New York Jets. Some of these legends don't get the proper send-off that they should, and it's because of their own pride. And I really wish Uriah Faber would let us send the legend off the way he's supposed to. I'll watch it. I won't be excited about it. As always, we appreciate your questions. You can find us every single week on social media. Big thanks to Louis Zatzman of Raptors Republic as well. Hope you enjoy the NBA Finals starting tonight. Hope you enjoy the NHL Finals as well. And I hope we see you next week right here. Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, whatever it is. I hope we see you next week right here on Press Row.